sorts of things. I'm very happy to, if you guys are interested. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I'm, I'm Jeff. I'm Hannah. Nice to meet Hello, you. Hannah. How are you? Good. And there's a couple of other people there with us as well. So, hello, other people. What's your <laughs> names? Oh, he's gone. I asked him his name and he went. <laughs> oh, there's someone. Hello. Hello. What's your Hannah. name? We have Hannah Paula. Hannah. Yep. Good. Well, that's lovely. So how many people are we expecting, do you think, uh, to join us? Well, hopefully at least 15. Um, oh, good. But it's lovely. always it's always a surprise, you know, who, yeah. who kind of shows up after they express interest. So, yeah. It's good. And so if people want to um, ask a question or make a contribution, what's the protocol? They just put their hand up, do they? And you, you give them the nod? Is that the way we do it? Um, yeah, I would encourage them to ask questions at any time, but I'll tell them in advance that we'll, we'll make a couple of pauses after after yeah. one or the yeah, other cool. question. So, um, and yeah. the protocol, there is actually this function um, to raise your hand, but I think if we're not more than 50 people, you can just kind of un unmute yourself and, uh, and ask the question right away. I think that's yeah. much easier. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, good. Well, it's seven o'clock, um, so will we get going or what do you think? Let's wait a couple of more minutes because we always see um, that people join too late and then they, they figure out the technology. Um, yep, good. It, worked. it, it, uh, it certainly works quite, uh, quite smoothly. And I think uh, it, we use, um, I'm, on the, I'm the uh, deputy chair of an academic board at the University of Gibraltar. So we do the same sort of thing, same time zone problem for me. Um, I have to get them to all come to, come in at nine o'clock so I don't go to sleep, you see. So yeah. the time is very good here. But uh, we use blue jeans. And I think I've used Zoom numerous times actually now. And I think Zoom um, seems to be just a little bit um, easier to use, you know, like blue jeans, it's got a, it's got a strange app. You know, you've got to click things and so on. <laughs> I like the idea of just clicking on it and saying join. I like something simple. Yeah. Now, I notice up on the top look, top bar here, there's a, there's a little arrow there. Do I, If I click on that, I can see other people. Is that how it works? Um, see the blue arrow up there, the, the little the, white. In your, in your upper right corner, there should be um, a yep. button with which you can switch the view that you have. Oh, and right. And there should be one with which you can see everyone at, at once. Okay, good. So I'll just click that now and just see what happens. Oh, yes, I can. So I can see Sarah, Levan, Tiffany, Pauline. Hello, everyone. Um, and then I can see Tom. Tom's there, but he's, in a, he's, he's maintaining a mysterious mode at this point in time. He's just got Tom on the screen. Well, now he's from. He, he, now you know he's from Rotterdam. So yeah, he is indeed from Rotterdam. It says that <laughs> across Rotterdam. Excellent. Hello. Oh, that's good. Well, hi guys. That's that's uh, for an okay. old man. Yeah. Un un using the interweb. <laughs> I'll get us. I'll get us going um, by okay. introducing you, uh, Jack. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for joining, uh, to uh, you especially Jeff and to everyone listening. Uh, Jeff is Emeritus Professor at the University of Western Sydney, a Professor for Higher Education and Sustainability. Um, during his active times he held numerous academic roles, prestigious academic roles one might say. Uh, he was Vice Chancellor for Quality Executive Director of Sustainability and uh, held many other positions. He led um, and studied change and leadership courses around the world um, in Australia, South Africa, Cambodia, the US, Scandinavia. Uh, and he likes to travel. He just came back from Scandinavia, um, where he's been on, on a uh, learning trip. Um, now he is co-chair of the Sustainab Sustainable Futures Leadership Academy and member of the Advisory Council of the Australian Campus Towards Sustainability. Uh, and his whole career has been about sustainability. He has been a ne uh, national senior teaching fellow of the Australian Office for Learning and Teaching, and we will talk about your work there a little bit uh, more deeply because um, what came out of this is uh, the website flipcurric.edu. 
which is a um, resource repository um, to drive change towards uh, more sustainability uh, in curricula. Um, and yeah, I'm excited you're here. Thank you very much. Uh, he's calling in from Australia, so uh, he has the last bit of sunlight while ours has just rise, arisen. Um, uh, I'm uh, happy that all of you uh, are showing your faces, except Tom, but maybe you'll join us later, Tom. <laughs> um, just a general introduction into LEAP um, for those of you who don't know, but I guess everyone does. It's our leadership program in Oikos, and a couple of the people present here are based, uh, involved in a very intensive leadership course over nine months, uh, where they do meetings and reflections and personal coaching and also these webinars. Um, yes, I'm, I encourage you to take uh, to take notes and ask questions uh, at any point in time. Um, Jeff asked me to do this in an interview-based way, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt um, so you can ask your, your own questions at any time as well. Um, and if you want to speak, just unmute yourself or raise your hand and give us a kind of sign. Yeah, so that's, that, that's the introduction. Uh, did I miss anything, Jeff? No, no, that's that's fabulous. It's uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be here and happy to help. And I hope uh, what we talk about today and what I share with you proves to be of interest and relevance to you guys. That's the main thing. You're the future, I'm the past. <laughs> well, you are the present, uh, um, quite frankly, because you have been working on this concept of of making students work ready plus and making them. Um, ready uh, to work in an environment, in an ever-changing environment of the 21st century. Uh, and I would like you to tell us a little bit more about the distinction between what you mean, what was meant earlier by work ready and what you mean by work ready plus. Yeah, good. So um, basically being work ready means that you're competent. So if you're doing a business course, there's a whole lot of knowledge and skills. If you're going to be an accountant, let's say, there's a whole lot of knowledge and skills about being an accountant uh, that you need in order to get going uh, in that profession. And that's being work ready for today. Uh, but work ready plus is how do you manage yourself when you're dealing with a mad client who's actually really difficult to deal with or something really goes wrong. And that's got a lot to do with being work ready plus. You can know a lot of skills and knowledge, but you might not be able to use them in a way that's responsive to a particular situation. So, and that's being capable. Competent is having skills and knowledge. Capable is being work ready plus. So the knowledge and skills is work ready for today. Uh, that's competence, being competent. And, but being capable is being work ready plus for tomorrow where you can handle unusual situations when things go wrong or awry. And as we know in life, but also in study and also in work, you know, our capability is tested not when things are running routinely, but when something unexpected happens or an unexpected opportunity comes up or something goes wrong that you didn't predict. And that's when your capability is really tested as a professional, but also as a human being. So it happens just as much in relationships as it does in terms of work. So what I've been very concerned about and what the Australian government hired me to look at is for Australia's universities, we were getting concerned about them spending too much time on getting students just to regurgitate skills and knowledge dictated to them in modules or in MOOCs and then regurgitate them back and hope that they would actually help the, our, uh, our country cope with the uh, challenges of the 21st century, which are social, cultural, economic and environmental fundamentally. So that's the distinction. So work ready has been competent for today and knowing a lot of skills and knowledge. Work Ready Plus has been capable of handling unexpected future events and being able to keep yourself up to date and being able to ha manage mad moments and wicked, wicked moments. Um, and you need both. You've got to have the skill and the knowledge. But the government got me to look at something more than that. So uh, is that making sense so far, What the distinction, everybody? So now I'll tell you what, the, what and I've now worked with 3,700 universities around the world on this over the last two years, on what might we actually argue is the right plus. What is the plus? So that it's, we've, we've identified at least four dimensions of being capable, of being work ready plus. The first dimension is being sustainability literate. Socially, culturally and economically, sustainability literate. Right, the four classic pillars of sustainability, which we pushed 
in the decade for education for sustainable development over over the, the period 205 to 214. So that's the first plus. There's four pluses. The second one is being change implementation savvy, being able to manage mad people, basically, being able to manage mad moments, being able to deal with situations that are actually full of dilemmas. And that requires emotional intelligence, the ability to manage yourself and remain calm when things go wrong. It requires mindfulness. It requires being able to work with diversity. So the first plus is being sustainability literate. The second plus is being change implementation savvy. And there our motto is, you can have all these great ideas about sustainability, but if you can't make them happen, it's useless. And our motto is, good ideas for sustainability development, are good ideas with no ideas on how to implement them, are wasted ideas. So there's a lot of people talking all the time about sustainability, to, them, to their friends who agree with them, how do you engage those who do not agree? And that's critical and still missing. <clears throat> so the first one is sustainability literate. The second is change implementation savvy. The third is learning how your, your potential to be creative and inventive. And it's no good having these MOOCs where you just regurgitate information and knowledge and so what we've now got is universities all around the world that I'm working with where we're building inventiveness, ethical entrepreneurialism, we're calling it, into the undergraduate curriculum, where people are actually given a, a, a chance to identify ways of dealing with key challenges that are facing us for the 21st century, intentionally given that chance in the undergraduate curriculum, not postgrad. And that's why you've got not just maker spaces and all of that stuff, but we've got a whole lot of students working around the world now on how would you deal with the problems of fractious division? Like actually deal with it, not just talk about it. What would you do, you know, about what's happening with Donald Trump? You know, what would you do about Kurt Wilders? You know, what would you do about Brexit? You know, these are all about social disharmony. And we know that the societies and we know that the institutions that are the most effective in this world are the ones where they do not have fractious division, where everyone is fighting one another. The most productive companies, and if you look at the way in which Google operates, right, are the ones where people actually come together and work in a harmonious way and creatively and enjoy the creativity. So you've got the first one, the first plus is sustainability literate. The second is change implementation savvy. The third is creative and inventive. And we've got that flip curric site that I mentioned has got wonderful examples we've brought together on how you might do it that I thought the Oikos group might just look at. There's a whole lot of stuff in business that we've gathered together. Now, the fourth one is the very interesting plus, and that is getting every single person who leaves a university because 95% of the world's leaders have a degree of a university and I do not want my leaders simply to be good at regurgitating information and knowledge back to me. I want my leaders to have a value position, a considered position on what they would do when faced with a dilemma on how to actually deal with a, a hot issue that's confronting their country and their institution and their workplace. And so the fourth plus is coming to your own considered position on the tacit assumptions driving the 21st century agenda. And you'll see how this relates to the Oikos um, mission. Those tacit assumptions we've identified are four of them at least. And we think every undergraduate should have clarified their position on where they stand on each of them. We're not saying what you should do, but you should think through what you stand for because that will help you identify your actual hidden values. So the first tacit assumption is growth is good for everyone. If you look at what happens on the televisions around the world every night in the news, they talk about green arrows and red arrows. Green arrows is the stock market going up. Red arrows is the stock market going down. Green is good, red is bad. Is that equally good for everyone? Is that equally good for the, uh, the 25 million people in the United States, you know, who are completely unemployed and can't see any opportunities? You know, like, is growth equally good for everyone? So that's the first tacit assumption. What's your position on that? Why? What value position are you, lies behind you saying that's what I stand for? So some people might say growth is good. You know what I mean? And all we want them to do is to articulate why they say that so we know what their value position is. 
So this, remember, is the fourth plus. Is this making sense, everyone, or not? So the second tacit assumption is consumption is happiness. When in doubt, buy, buy an iPhone 7. When in doubt, buy an iPhone 8. Don't buy a Samsung, of course, because they blow up. You can't get them on the plane. But what happens to the iPhones 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5? There's no cradle-to-cradle -cradle design. We, we are all victims, really, of that notion of constant consumption must be good. What's your value position on that? Where do you stand on it? Do you think it is a good idea or not a good idea, and why? So growth is good, consumption's happiness, information and communications technology is always the answer is the next tacit assumption. It is the answer, but it isn't, in my view. You know, for example, if you look at what Trump's done using social media and using Twitter, you know, he's converted the notion of, of communicating with people into 140 letters, which is emotionally laden, never factual. And, you know, you'll find I, my, one of my daughters is an actress in Hollywood and I was over there on the train and I went on 10 stations on the train. There were two girls sitting next to one another. Both of them had an iPhone 7. They were taking selfies and sending them to one another. They did not speak to one another for 17 stations. So growth is good. Consumption's happiness. Information technology is always the answer. And the final one is globalization's great. It's so relieving when you go to your Ridges Hotel in Prague or in New York or in Sydney to see the same soap in the same wire place with the beds made the same way, with the people on the desk saying the same words to you but with a slightly different accent. And yet we know that adaptability for change, for sustainable societies requires diversity. We need, you do not have one field running one crop for 10 years and hope to, in fact, have an adaptable uh, agriculture. The same thing goes for humanity. So you can see my bias, but the point about those tacit assumptions, why shouldn't we have a curriculum like that rather than just learning all the skill and knowledge and regurgitating it, why don't we make it exciting for students uh, by actually looking at the, the pluses, the four pluses, growth is good, um, consumption's happiness, information technology is the answer, and what's your position on those four tacit assumptions? So that's, can you see what I'm getting at? Like, a lot of what universities do is actually about competence, about skills and knowledge, you know what I mean? And there's not enough about these areas of the plus areas. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a long answer, but I hope it hasn't confused everyone. Um, maybe, uh, it, does that make sense? Is that interesting or not, guys? Yeah. Maybe we open up. Maybe we open up for a, a first round of short questions. Yeah. I certainly have some questions about how you do it, and I'm sure the others have too. So I'm just gonna, yeah, Paulina, you have a question. I don't know if it fits, but I would like to ask um, because I writing my master's thesis about education and companies, and. Um, because especially in Germany, not everybody is going to universities and everybody in a company, in my opinion, should be educated about sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, do you think this, this um, work ready plus um, should be there for also in the companies? Because yeah, mm -hmm. you have graduated students, but you have all the other people and you have people who yeah, finished school before sustainability was a topic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, th I think uh, in um, terms of professional what development... What do you think about uh, like education in workplace? Yep. So education in the workplace, like the professional development programs that companies often run, um, there, there is plenty of room for doing just what I was saying in terms of what's the company doing, for example, uh, around uh, the blue economy, which I can talk about later. I hear you, sir. You, you can't hear me? Can you hear me, Alex? We seem to have frozen. Yeah, well, we can all hear you. I think it's uh, on Paulina's end. Um, she has a connection error. Maybe we can come back to the question when she's reconnected. Okay, good. Yeah. Or you just answer it and she'll see it in the, in the, uh, like in the video. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, the question is basically then, you know, what do you do about those who are already out in the workplace about sustainability? Um, 
one of the things that we're doing around the world is you need to understand what the management in companies is motivated by. So one of the things that managements in business are motivated by is, uh, is money, is profitability, not loss. So we've developed at the United Nations University this concept of the blue economy, which is happening right across the world now, where you actually get students and workers to identify how to make money out of waste. So um, I can talk later about the blue economy because I think it's something that's directly relevant uh, to what you guys can do, not only at your university, uh, but you can also actually be advocating it when you get out into a company because companies like to make money. They don't want to make a loss. So if you can actually start to look at sustainability as a way of making money out of waste, and I'll talk about that later on to you, that's a much better way to actually engage people and to simply say, why don't you run some program on sustainability? And what we've got is examples of how you can make money out of waste that actually can apply. And wouldn't it be good if Oikos actually started to actually get students to look in the companies in which they're operating or in which they have placements at, the, at blue economy projects? We, we call it the blue economy, not because we want to avoid people thinking it's about being green, because green divides people, you know what I mean? where it's called the blue economy because the earth looks blue from space. It doesn't look green. Um, so, and, and the, the, if you're interested in the blue economy projects, I can tell you a couple of them uh, about them later if you want to. But if we don't have time, all you've got to do is put blue economy into your search engine. The home page will come up. And on the top bar, you'll see the 101 projects we've got going around the world. Um, and so that's how, I, in my view, you don't sort of come in and lecture people in the workplace, you've got to start with their motivators, not yours, you know what I mean? And you've got to be artful, which is what, that's a plus, isn't it? You know, like that's being diagnostic and a little bit like don't just lecture them on your skill and knowledge you've got. You've got to go with the human first before you go with the knowledge. Does that make sense or not? Yes, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you for your insight. Okay. Lovely. Yep. Uh, um, there's a, this other thing to, um, to your research uh, and, and to Flipkirk uh, where you say assessment has a central role, has always had a central role in higher education and obviously the regurgitating and the things that you criticize, um, those, those are actually um, problems of assessment. So what you say, you need uh, a different kind of assessment, powerful assessment as you call it, um, in order to promote um, the, the flipping of the curriculum. So how, yep. how does that work, that assessment? So, uh, so this, this website, guys, is just, if you wanted to look at what's on it, you just put flip curric into your search engine and it'll come up again. Um, flip curric. We've, I've used the term flip curric because what I think's happening in higher education around the world is people, the academics, I mean, quickly come up with program level outcomes, all of which sound the same, you know, they're just all cliches, you know, like lifelong learners and knowing how to be an effective tourism manager or, you know, whatever it is. There's insufficient careful consideration of what the program level outcomes should be, but the degree level outcomes. So flip curriculum is flipping the whole idea of curriculum design on its head by starting with the outcomes first and spending a lot of time making sure you've got them. So Work Ready Plus, for example, you know, not just Work Ready, and thinking carefully through how you came up with those capabilities you know, that you have to be developed. And Flip curric has got a whole lot of tips on that from the 3,700 universities on how you can actually do that in a sensible way. So that's the first point. The second point is powerful assessment. It's no good to be assessing thoroughly it's no good to be uh, sort of avoiding plagiarism if what you're assessing is rubbish. And the, the assessment should be assessing valid, powerful learning outcomes. So powerful assessment is assessing, you know, how you manage dilemmas and problems when, uh, when things are going wrong in, in real world contexts out in the organisation. Uh, it shouldn't just be only about the skills and knowledge, but it has a part. So... Powerful assessment is tied up very much with having powerful learning outcomes determined in the first place. So uh, that, that's really, I think, the critical thing. And I think we should be assessing less but assessing better. Uh, and one of the things we're now doing in a lot of universities uh, at the undergraduate level is we've got a capstone subject 
called Dilemmas of Professional Practice, where we've gathered in from successful graduates working in sustainability in business, for example, uh, when they were most challenged in their first three or four years of professional practice. And those moments of challenge are used in a, a capstone subject where people come together and look at the dilemma that person faced and then ha they look at how they'd handle it, then they compare how they'd handle it with how the person actually did handle it using a little capability framework that actually explains the, the various uh, capabilities that you really need. So powerful assessment is tied into inter transdisciplinary notions of how you manage difficult moments. Um, it's not just about skills and knowledge and regurgitating it. That's just a small part of it. Um, so a powerful assessment is about how you manage the wicked moments um, in particular. You know, when you're out there and you're an unusual situation, how do you manage that? And did you actually get something to work in practice? Do you have a good example of, of, of that kind of assessment? Yes. Yeah, so, I, I mean, there's many of them. I'll give you one in medicine, right? So at McMaster University in Canada that I work with, uh, the, the people who are in their final year of undergraduate training as a general practitioner, in their they have this dilemma as a professional practice subject, which they go through a whole lot of these, these uh, wicked moments that early career general practitioners have come up with. And they, they use them almost to get used to the idea that things don't always go smoothly. And then in their final exam last year, they come into an examination room. Each of them has a computer in front of them. They, on the computer screen uh, is a young mother sitting in a, a general practitioner's waiting room with two children by her side. She's very well off. She's got the latest iPhone. She's talking to her husband saying, darling, I'm just at the, at the uh, doctors at the moment getting back my routine results from the mammography check. You know, the mammography check. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll be home at three and I've got the quail and the rye berries ready for our uh, uh, dinner party tonight, you know, and, uh, and uh, I'll be back soon, darling, and it's all fabulous and the kids are hugging her, right? They then convert, this is each doctor, 100, 100 of them are sitting in the exam room, right? They see that scenario being played out. Then it cuts to the, what the general practitioner inside the office, right? is seeing on the screen in terms of the mammography results and the blood tests for this woman. Skill and knowledge. They have to read those and work out what's going on. And if they read them correctly, she's actually got secondaries and it's quite bad news. Right, she's 28. So it's not, not at all good. So the first part of the exam is they have to send off to the server what their diagnosis is, having read the mammography results and the bloods. That goes off to the server. Is that clear? That's just testing skill and knowledge, competence, isn't it? Then they say, right, she's walking through the door right now. How are you going to break the news? And they have to type out how they're going to break the news to her. That goes off to the server. So you can do it with 100 people, you can do it with 500. All right? Then they say, now have a look at how the general practitioner broke the news. And an actor acts out how this woman who was the general practitioner actually broke the news to that 28-year-old mum. They then have to write an essay, which they get back their results with the mammography results and the blood, so they have to write an essay, first of all, talking about how accurate their, their, their reading was of the bloods and the mammography. So that's almost like critically appraising their accuracy to this, do basically competent work. They then have to compare how they broke the news to the mother with how the doctor did using the top 12 capabilities that we've identified from studies of successful early career general practitioners, most of which are to do with the personal and interpersonal capabilities. So what you're getting there, can you see what I'm trying to get at? You're actually bringing into an integrated real world moment of an actual human being who's going to have to be sort of counseled in a very emotionally sensitive way, skill and knowledge first, yes, but in the context of a human being. So our motto is, and if you're interested in this guys, we've got 240 examples of this on that Flip Correct website, right? Um, and you know, we've got a whole lot in business as well. But, I, but that one it sort of, I think, explains the difference between testing competence and testing capability, doesn't it? 
in the context of a real human being and a wicked moment, yes? Like that's not a routine thing, you know? You know, you're all fine, see you later, you know what I mean? This is, how the hell are you going to do it when, you know, as a general practitioner, you've only got 10 minutes, you know how those, you've got you to move people through, mm -hmm. right? And that's what you want, isn't it? That's what I want in a doctor. I want them, first of all, to be able to read my, my you know, pathology results, you know what I mean, correctly, but I also want them to treat me in a way that makes me feel like I want to come back to them. Yeah. Is that yeah. clear or not? See the reactions? Yeah. Okay, yep. Power, that's powerful assessment. And you'll notice that, um, that hidden in that powerful assessment is something where you guys are actually crucial ingredients in actually making the assessment and the outcomes relevant. And that's what you'll see on that Flipkirk website. We've, got, we've done studies of successful early career graduates in nine professions where they've identified the capabilities that, they've, that, that, that led them to be chosen as so effective by their clients, their supervisors and their colleagues. We've got a little framework for them to do that. And they've identified the wicked moments. So on that website it is all of those studies. If we've done them in business, we've done them in accounting, in sports management, for example, around the world. And it seems to me that wouldn't it be nice if Oikos was to advocate to the university in a humble way, a, a way of actually getting the curriculum powerful by actually going out and doing studies of successful early career graduates who'd gone out from the business degrees and been working in the sustainability dimension. You know, like Deloitte Touche has people who work as sustainability consultants, right? So, you know, just identify where people don't just go to business, but they go out to these sustainability edged business jobs, like sustainable tourism. And to find the ones that the, uh, that the employers, the clients, and the colleagues say are doing a great job, but three to five years out and your backward map to them. So flipping the curriculum is spending a lot of time making sure you get the outcomes focus right. You know, the wicked moments, the capabilities, right? And I say use students as co-creators of the curriculum, but the students are actually the successful early career graduates, not just the people who've come in. Do you know what I mean? Like you need people who've gone out for just a couple of years who are doing a good job to be a key agent for actually making the curriculum relevant. Um, I'd be interested to know how do you, um, how do you learn about their motivation and how and about their change of mindsets uh, and, and how um, can uh, professors and especially in, in business and economics where people go uh, relatively blindly into these positions where they, they have, they make quite a lot of decisions um, uh, with those tacit assumptions. Uh, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so what's the process of, of reflecting on these tacit assumptions and make them more outspoken? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Do how, you mean the, how, the students or the, or the professors at the university? Um, so uh, if we assume that the professors are already at a point where they can reflect on that, how, do they break it to the students that they have these tacit assumptions that might be wrong? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, uh, the art is not to say you're right or wrong. The art is to ask people to reflect and come up with their own argument as to why they think they're right. So, you know, the tacit assumptions, you could have one subject in a business degree, which is what's your view on the tacit assumptions driving the 21st century agenda? You know, you could have a subject on that, you know what I mean? where people have to come and the, and the assessment would be actually their argued position, which ultimately ends up to be not a logical one, but a value one, right? It's values. And, and the point being that you can say that change occurs, that's something's become different. Do you know what I mean? You can see it's different. Progress is a value judgment that that's been beneficial. And so when people say that's progress, it's the art of getting them to, uh, to, it's their epistemology, really, it's their ethics. It's to get them to say, why do you say that's progress? What is it that leads you to say that? Where did that come from? And are you comfortable with, now you've thought about it, that you actually do, still do see that as progress? 
So that's the students. The same thing goes for the academics, you know, the staff, you know. And the point for you guys is why I mentioned successful early career graduate studies. You can't go straight into the professors and say, look, you've got tacit assumptions. You're coming up with crappy courses. You know, we know what you should do because they get all defensive. You've got to suck them in like fishing, you know. And so the fishing is to make their ego feel good by saying, wouldn't it be cunning if we just, we, we don't have to sort of do this in any big way. Why don't we just start with a little humble project with some successful early career graduates from us, you know, people who are doing well. Why don't we look at what they've come up with as relevant? Because we could probably nick that and some of that stuff we could do to make you look good so that, you know, you can actually spread that around so everyone has a more satisfying time teaching, you know. And all you do is you take someone who's all a bit ready and you just do it with them in a small way. You know, that's, that's how you manage change. You know, you don't, you don't try and do the whole lot at once. You fish, but with the right person. And the whole art is I'm just a humble, caring, giving person who's trying to make you look good. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's how you do it. That mm. leads us to, to the next um, question that... I would like would have liked to discuss with you, um, which is students' involvement in these um, in flipping curricula. Mm -hmm. So, what can each of each one of us do uh, in interaction with our university and especially individuals, like you said, yeah. the, the ones who who might seem ready? Um, mm -hmm. What is our role? So, I mean, what you can't do is to simply uh, come in as an individual, but. If the university has a student governing council or if the university has student representatives sitting on its academic board or on its, uh, its regulatory bodies, then the art is to talk with those student colleagues about raising the sorts of things that I've said. So you don't come in, you've got to use, in a Machiavellian way, if you like, you've got to use the structures are there. But you need to actually, and, and one thing that always worries me about student representatives is they don't represent anyone usually. That's just their own point of view. They don't go out and bloody ask everyone what's going on. So you need to be actually proactive. In, you need to get a caucus group together about what you think is a worthwhile, relevant and feasible idea and then talk to the student representatives on the governing council so that they are able to raise it because they have a, they have a regulatory role. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to actually talk to amenable academics about a little project like I was saying, because you're doing the Orcos projects anyway, but one around looking at successful early career graduates who have a sustainability role as a project, you know what I mean? With an academic. So the academic gets armed with these real life stories. So that's the, uh, the, second, the second dimension. Um, the third one is that most universities have student feedback systems of some description you know are you happy how could we improve things you know that so if the university has that then the art is to actually start to look more carefully as a group at what you might want to say in relation to any of those questions so rather than it just being me by myself it's the art of developing your own coalition of thinking it through so that when you respond to these survey items for example it's actually through a thought through process that everyone's discussed so that's three forms of it. But I think the most interesting one, I just did this last year um, for the, the Association of Commonwealth Universities. That, that's the old British Empire ones. We had last year our focus for students as co-creators of the curriculum. And so those three areas are ones that are now um, underway in the, in the British Commonwealth of Universities. Um, but there's many others. But, you know, so co-creation of the curriculum is sort of a little bit more cunning than just thinking as an individual you might try and tell people because often you need a coalition of thought through processes and that means you've got to actually be able to organize yourselves around what's your position if you know what i mean knowing that you've got to deal with their ego you've got to always make them feel like you're making them look good does that answer the question or not it, it does, but uh, maybe it opens up other questions. So I again want to ask into into the group. Do you have any direct questions that you want to ask? Well, then, uh, Jeff, we can directly dive into the examples uh, that you have. 
um, have prepared and have worked on for, for many years, uh, mm. especially the blue economy is, is such a, a nice looking uh, and, and well-made resource page uh, with all these these very interesting cases and you also just came back from Antarctica where you also had uh, you know directly made the connection to higher education um, mm. so I'd like to ask you about these examples okay so um, I was trying to, I was trying to think um, what would be relevant to the Oikos approach you know where as I understand it people have projects that they're doing is that correct so then I just thought these two might be a, as a little menu for future people or for you guys. It depends on where you're at. So the Blue Economy projects, as I said, are essentially about two things. They're about making money out of waste and creating employment. So a lot of them, but not all of them, operate in the third world in countries um, where uh, giving people an opportunity to get a bit of work is actually a really morally decent thing to be doing. So... I'll give you just one example, uh, but there are hundreds of them. So in, in um, Palabora in uh, northwest South Africa, the Afri African National Congress, you know, the one Mandela that set up when Mandela got in in 93, 94 after he was released from uh, Robben Island, they gave money to a black township at Palabora. So it's just a tiny little township um, in northwest South Africa to set up a citrus farm. And no one knew what to do with it. And in, within eight years, it was going broke. So the African National Congress, the ruling party there, brought in McKinsey's from New York. And McKinsey's came in and said, if you automate, uh, fire all the blacks and automate, you might make money out of it, right? So it's at moments like that, a wicked moment, right, that the Blue Economy projects work. And they always work by bringing in students and academic staff, transdisciplinary teams, and their job, remember the work ready plus about being creative and inventive, remember? And sustainability literate. Mm -hmm. So they come in and what they're, what they're asked to do is to think laterally, diagnose what in the hell can we do to save the jobs of these black township people who will have no work otherwise. How can we do it? And they've got to think laterally. There's no blueprint, right? It's none of this sort of stuff about apply a formula. So here's what they did. They started off by the tourism students from business, came up with the plant biologists and the chemists and a bunch of uh, agricultural science students and their academic staff. The tourism students knew that right next to Palabora, this township where the citrus farm was, inside the gate of the park was Kruger National Park. Have you heard of Kruger National Park? The big game park, right? So the tourism students went in there and they knew about these game lodges where people my age who've got lots of money come down for a couple of weeks, spend 10,000 bucks, bring their large DLSR camera, take photographs of lions and, you know, leopards and sit around at night and show the photographs to one another, right? So they went in there and they said to the game lodge people, uh, where do you get your orange juice from? And they said, oh, we fly it up frozen from Johannesburg. And they said, do you think that the clients you have, these rich old people, would be interested if we could bring in fresh orange juice in season from the village down the road, they could meet the local villagers who could talk about their life here and supply the orange juice. Do you think they'd be interested? They said, oh, that's good. So that's the original product. There's no money being made out of waste yet, right? So here's the, the lateral way in which they, they proceeded from that. One of the young people said looking at this fire, what, the open fire, you know, people sit around there when they're having their cocktails, you know, in front of an open fire, showing one another photographs. Where do you get your firewood? And they said, oh, we have to buy it in. They said, well, we could bring it in from the citrus farm. So that's your first off cuts, right? That's the first money out of waste. Then the, uh, then the uh, plant biologist said, do you think your people would be interested in shiitake mushrooms? If we were able to grow them, on the detritus from the citrus farm, right? Do you think they'd find that interesting? And the game lodge people said, yeah, absolutely, because they take photographs of it. They could say to their kids when they got home, these shiitake mushrooms we ate were growing on the leaf litter from a citrus farm in a village that otherwise was going to go broke. So firewood, shiitake mushrooms growing in, a, and we got a little tin shed built up there for them, and we grow shiitake mushrooms, right? Then the third, that's, one, that's two sources of waste so far. Then the, uh, we, the, uh, the chemist said, 
don't throw the orange peels away. We can make limonene out of that, right? You know, limonene, a biogradable detergent that comes out of orange peels. So we got them a limonene press for 20,000 Rand. It paid itself off in three months, right? And they took the limonene into the game lodges. The game lodges then washed their dishes and their clothes in the limonene and the water that, the, the water that came out was brought back and put onto the orange grove. Can you see what I'm getting out of here? This is how students should be learning at university, right? Then the, then the agricultural scientist said, don't throw the orange peels away. We'll give them to cattle because orange peel is an ideal cleansing agent for the first gut of cattle. So I don't know how many bits of waste there, four, four or five pieces. We have now got full employment in the village. The village now goes into the game park and talks about the local black culture as well. You know what I mean? Like you've got liaison and you've got a whole lot of people, instead of McKinsey's, the New York way of doing business, right? A single product line. Instead of that, you've actually got full employment. You've got cultural interchange. You've got social sustainability, economic sustainability, environmental sustainability and sustainable tourism. If, you're, if that takes your fancy, just think of Oikos projects. Have a look at the others. They are stunning. Like we've got South Sudan, we're growing maggots on bones in, a, in one of the abattoirs in South Sudan. They used to throw the bones away. Now we put flies on them. We grow the maggots on the bones. We bleed the maggots of the antibiotic because maggots, in order to eat the rotten stuff they eat, have the most, one of the most powerful natural antibiotics of any creature in the world. That is sold off for very good money. Then the maggot, having been bled for the antibiotic, is fed to fish and quail. So it becomes an automatic fish feed and a quail feed. And the quail, we, we sell the eggs, the quail eggs, to London for £20 a dozen. And I'll give you one other blue economy one. I, was, I, I do a lot of work in the Pacific Islands at the University of the South Pacific. In Samoa... At, at our campus in Samoa, right, we have a piggery, you know, a pig farm. So here's what we've done at the pig farm. Uh, at, this is blue economy at its best. So before they used to have to spend a whole lot of money bringing in pig feed to feed the pigs, right? Had to be shipped in from overseas, the pig feed. They also have to bring in uh, um, chicken, chicken feed, you know, chicken pellets to feed the chickens. So here's what we did. We got uh, the piggery when the we got the pig's droppings. We washed the pig's droppings in a drain down a hill. We put in ponds so that the, the, the water has been constantly circulated by a solar pump, you know, just a little photovoltaic pump on the roof. So there's constant water coming in whenever the pig's crap. The, the, the feces is washed out into this drain. It goes down to the first pond where the solids settle out, the top water, because it's constantly circulating, the top water washes into the second pond where algae grow, fish eat the algae, you kill the fish, you feed the fish to the pigs. So you no longer have to spend all that money and all those carbon miles bringing in pig feed. Then the other thing we did as part of the campus is there's this snail called the African snail has got into the Pacific Islands. It's a feral snail and it's very bad. So what we now do is we pay the kids 10 cents a bucket and they go out into the, into the jungle. They collect a bucket of snails, they get 10 cents. What do we do with the snails? We feed them to the chickens because the snail shell's got the ideal grit for chicken uh, shells and the inside of the snail has got stunning protein. They no longer have to bring in chicken feed and you're getting rid of a feral creature at the same time. That's the blue economy. Does that make sense or not, guys? So if you're interested in, I mean, you don't have to be, but if you're interested, it's great fun because it, you, you, if you did it like, like transdisciplinary, and we're doing it in 150 unis around the world now, you know, it's much more fun to actually do something like that than to simply just do the skill and knowledge and do the exam, you know what I mean? Um, so that's, that's, that's that one. And just on the Antarctica, so I've just come back from a sustainability expedition into the Antarctic. And one of the things I just thought Oikos might be interested in doing at least one project somewhere, is to do a stock take of all of the research that's underway on what's happening for sustainable tourism in the Antarctica because it's going to be a big problem. 
1993, there were 3,000 tourists went down there. This year, there's 48,000. And there's a pressure now to take down larger and larger ships. There's all sorts of risks that are associated with it, you know, like bringing in uh, feral seeds, bringing in feral insects on your boots. You know, there's all sorts of things that can happen when people land. There's the trauma that can happen to the penguins if people come too close. There's, uh, we've already had one ship go up on, uh, hit, by, hit by an iceberg and hold and sank and then did an oil spill down there, you know what I mean? So, you know, that's the cons. The pros is if you can get good people to go there, they can become advocates for keeping the wilderness. So I just, it just struck me when I was down there with colleagues that, you know, I said to them, I was coming back and having this chat to you, and I said, you know, it would be really good if we got business students who were interested in sustainable tourism, you know what I mean, like that dimension that you have in business courses, to actually sort of do a little international, you know, four or five little teams all start to look at the, their own perspective of for sustainable tourism in the Antarctic. We've got the Antarctic Treaty. We've got a lot of people who are interested. It's about to take off. Wouldn't it be lovely to do something where at least some students in business schools actually came up, you know, with, with a bit of a collective position on that? Um, so well, yeah, yep. sorry. Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, that's probably as boring as bats to all of you, but anyway, I mean, I thought I'd, I'd throw those in as a couple of ideas for some cunning plans for you, but you, if you don't find them as relevant, then that's sweet, my dears, but I thought I'd at least share them with you. Yep. Um, I can really recommend the, the website, uh, Blue Economy, just, and, and as, you, as you've just uh, proven, you know, those are just such... Uh, inspiring stories um, mm. that can just by reading them help you to make better decisions in, in your everyday uh, mm. situation. So um, one of our objectives today was also to kind of get you talking and um, get you to talk about your success stories in projects and, and uh, maybe think of the last project that you've, that you've completed um, mm. and, and to say, well, that was one moment where I realized that, um, you know, I made a great decision or I, I, um, I solved a problem in a team um, uh, um, that really let, let me, let our project to, to succeed. So um, uh, yep. I'm not sure if, if uh, uh, anyone has um, the perfect story on board, but I really encourage you to, um, to just uh, open up and uh, maybe share a little bit from your last project with, mm. with Jeff. Mm. Maybe Jeff, you can you do a better job at encouraging uh, since oh, you've been no, doing no. that for so long. I mean, don't be shy, guys. Um, I'll just start. I'll start off by the fact of what I've learnt. I'm 71 now, right? So I'm virtually dead. What I've learnt over my long career on trying to manage mad people and projects is the the four L's of project implementation. Always start by listening, not by telling. So listening with a case for change and some ideas of what might work that you've found through your little bit of research worked elsewhere. So I've always started with a project with listening with those who are going to be engaged with the project, All right? Always start by listening first. And this, of course, is what makes for a capable change manager. Remember the Work Ready Plus, you know, change implementation savvy? So the first thing is you always start by listening with a case for change and a few cunning plans that you've dug up from someone else. Right? Then the second thing is having done that, you link together, having spoken to people about the case for change and the options, you ask them, which one do you think are most relevant to you? Are there any aspects of that that really take your fancy? And then you link together what most people say uh, they found as being potentially relevant to address. So that's link. Listen, link. The four L's. Listen, link. Leverage is to start is to get start small with just a couple of people just to try out the idea that most people thought was worthwhile and you say there the idea is we're going to learn by doing we're not going to learn we're not going to do the whole lot at once we're going to learn under controlled conditions so that you know if mr cock up visits and the thing doesn't work you know it's okay we're just trying to make the thing work out how to make it work so listen link leverage and then lead is you only scale up after you've worked out in a little group, finally, what's likely to be good. And then you use the little group as coaches for the others to learn how to do it. 
So listen, link, leverage, and then lead, and leaders scale up. Does that make, is that helpful or not, guys? And it's so much better because you get more brains on it, but it's, got, it's called steered engagement. Steered engagement. And the way you do steered engagement is listen, link, leverage, and lead. So what I'd love to hear is, I mean, from you guys, what your projects are even, like what they are and, you know, little aspects that are working well and little wicked moments that you've, en you've encountered yourselves. You know, I, I think that's how you can help one another actually get something sort of morally decent going uh, for everyone. But so if you don't want to say, then that's fine, but I'd love to hear from you if you've got any thoughts at all, really. You're so sweet. <laughs> yeah, if nobody says something, I can say something. Um, at the moment, I'm not really present in my August chapter, but I'm doing an internship. And yep. the internship um, I do in an, in, yeah, in an NGO, which mm -hmm. is dealing with um, yeah, kind of um, helping um, different people in the world and they try to um, create more justice for the people so they are very much engaged in the social component and try to foster in this way through research but also uh, via um, yeah, bottom-up project to foster, foster social entrepreneurs um, and this is really great and amazing and I also learn a lot but for example what I really recognize also there's a yeah, huge comprehension of the social justice aspect mm -hmm. Um, most of the people also pay somehow attention to the environmental aspects, mm. um, but somehow I don't know. I think it's kind of forgot. Yeah, it's yeah, it mm. seems to be forgotten sometimes mm. in many aspects. Also, because I mean, for the project they have to fly around the world and mm. do a lot of things and also paper waste and so on. And so, yeah, right now we just. Um, we're just doing some research about the current policies and so on. Mm. And um, so my supervisor and me, we also talked about how we could, for example, create like incentives for the employees to, um, mm. to, to commute greener, greener to work, like yeah, incentives to use bike, bike more because mm. I'm in the Netherlands right now. And mm. so the bike is a really good um, yeah, transport. Mm transport um, mm. thing and also like kind of small channel challenges that can be implemented in mm. the working environment um, for example to yeah to um, lower the waste um, and also pay more attention to solve more things but this is something where I want to do my research now and then try to also implement it and yeah that's mm. what I'm doing right now and yeah if you maybe have some mm suggestions for me how I can maybe also because I'm the intern and also mm. the relationship to the other employees is more led like on an equal basis I'm yeah <laughs> I'm not so shy but I'm I don't feel like superior and I wouldn't go to this uh, CIO and say hey this is my mm. idea and so maybe you have some suggestions to me yep. how I can be more <laughs> can yep, be that's that's uh that's uh it's a lovely little example of, um, I don't know whether the Oikos does this already, but I, I won't answer directly on what I think you could do, but, mm -hmm. I, but I've got an idea that from what you've said. Wouldn't it be nice if Oikos could actually, for the people who've already finished projects that went well, right, for them to identify some of the key challenges that they faced and how they address them. So this is... It, it, you can't actually do this yourself, but it's, it's an idea for Adriana and Adrian. It would be really terrific, I think, to help you. You know what I mean? Like, so you're not alone, but what you, what's really handy is people who've gone down the Oikos track and done okay. We always love a fellow traveller a bit further down the path who's doing well, you know, to tell us what happens and it's okay and expect this to happen. And when this happens, you know, like trying to deal with senior people, you know, what what would be great is for you to find from someone who'd done that who's like you, you know what I mean? For them mm -hmm. saying, here's what I did. Like, rather than an old bloke like me saying it, you know what I mean? It's much more relevant to you guys if, if Adrian and Adriana were able to bring together a Lonely Planet guide to doing Oikos projects. You know Lonely Planet guides, you know, when you're going to another country? It's, this is a bit like going to another country, you know? And what Lonely Planet does is take people who've gone to that country 
who've done well and haven't died, as it were, to come up with, watch out for this. This is a key thing when you're doing these projects. Here are some classic things that happen. Here's how I found to handle them in ways that work. So I'm not answering your question directly, but I'm giving, a, I'm giving the Oikos community a little idea of producing a, a successful traveller's guide to doing an Oikos project by using those who have already completed the project who did a good job to give you, as you're getting going, you know what I mean, cunning mm -hmm. ideas, what to watch out for. You know, yeah. these, are, these are classic things. Here's how I handled it. So, um, I mean, that's, that's essentially really a better way to answer your question. It's not a helpful way right now, but it's a better way to answer your question than for me to try and just say, listen, link, leverage and lead. You know, you basically vomit on me. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Does um, that make sense? Also, what, sorry? Does that make sense or not, though? Yeah, it makes totally sense. And I mean, you cannot answer such. It was not once a question, but I mean, this is already a suggestion. So it's a good suggestion, in my opinion. And um, or an interesting one. Um, one other question. How is it normally... Um, you you talked about these groups of universities who create this project. How do they settle that, or how they do they come together? Is it initiated by one, and how does it normally work? In uh, in Europe, there's a network of sustainability focused universities called the Copernicus Network of Universities, mm -hmm. um, and the president was actually Clemens Marder, who did work for Oikos. Um, so. Clemens would be your contact for that. And then in that, those universities, every one of them has students doing projects on sustainability. So again, it's, it's, it's the, my little suggestion, or uh, Copernicus is spelt uh, as in Copernicus, as in uh, um, uh, Krakow, a COP. Is it like this? Yep, Copernicus, yeah, that's it. Yep, mm -hmm. that's it. Um, so the Copernicus Network, uh, and I know Adrian and Adriana uh, could put you into contact that because they know Clemens anyway. And Jana Dluha is currently, I think, running it out of Charles University in Prague. I, I was a visiting professor there last year. Um, and that's a great little network, and it's got a whole student sub-network, Hannah. Um, you know, so that, and that's in Europe. That's, and and I, quite frankly, I think Europe's doing a much better job uh, than the States North America is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I think you're fortunately placed in a sense. Um, the, other, the other network to mention to you, um, which I'd like uh, you all to be at least aware of, is the United Nations University endorses what they call regional centres of expertise in education for sustainable development. I don't know whether you've heard of these, but they're called RCEs, regional. Levan, you, you're nodding. You, have you heard of them? Yep. Yep, good. Um, yep, so regional centres of expertise in education for sustainable development. There are many of them in Europe and a lot of them uh, you can access through the Copernicus network of universities. And all of them have students actively doing community projects, including blue economy projects. Okay. Um, and there's, and, and uh, Adriana's just yeah. sent off the, the website there for the Copernicus Alliance. Thank um, you. So there's lots of, I mean, that's the trouble with life is, is if you get in the right network, you've got a whole lot of brains helping you look good. You know what I mean? And if you don't get in the right network, you're doing it, you're reinventing the wheel. So, you know, do a successful traveler's guide for Oikos so that you don't have to start reinventing the wheel and certainly have a look at the RCEs, the regional centers of expertise in Europe and have a look at the Copernicus network. And for example, there are three or four RCEs in the Netherlands. Because uh, I've been to one of them, yeah. Thanks. Okay, mate. Mm -hmm. All right. And good luck with your election, by the way, Hannah. Thanks. <laughs> That's going to be interesting, isn't it? Uh, anyway. All right. Well, there, there we go. So is that enough, guys, from me? Adrian? Any more, any more questions on the floor? Yep. Good job. No. I, I just wanted to say that um, this is something that, that Adriana and I, we can, we can take up maybe as a part of LEAP, you know, collecting the stories because there's so many stories shared and, uh, and, and the, the smaller the group, the better um, this, this, this exchange of, um, 
mm. of problems uh, actually works. And, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, Tommy and Tifan and Tana were all engaged in, in these groups, in these smaller reflection groups, do that a lot. So um, it's just a way of, of really tapping or, yeah. or asking asking our members to, to write down a little bit. Um, of, That's of right. It's, and it's, it's working out the... the Looking at these, like getting started, you know what I mean? Getting started the first six months or something, you know what I mean? What happens there? What are the dilemmas that you might expect? If you do, they do come up, don't get worried. Here's what we did, you know what I mean? So you're not left all by yourself. And it's a little bit like the journey, you know, just like a little travel guide, really. And what's the worst outcome? You know, you look at it and you can't find anything that's helpful. And then, you know, you would then tell Adrian or Adriana, there's nothing on this, you know, and they could go and it, it makes it a community of hunting up successful ways to make something work. And that's a great learning to, to come up with if you want to be change implementation savvy. Remember the plus? Yeah. Are there any more questions for Jeff? Uh, do, you, do you have anything left from, from what you've heard earlier that you want, would like to have answered? Mm. No, that's, that's more than enough from me. I just hope you guys have found it relevant and uh, and uh, certainly I'm always happy just to respond. If you if, if you want to follow up with email, you know, if, if, for example, people have something they can send it into one of you two and you can send me a collective email and it's easy for me in Australia, I can just send back my thoughts for what they're worth. Nothing is lost. It's quick and easy for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, at least you get a, a geriatric Australian's perspective on the world which itself is sort of kind of different. <laughs> oh, uh, well, all right. Well, well um, then uh, let me thank you uh, so, so much, uh, Jeff, for joining us, um, for talking to us and uh, being so energetic at this late hour um, yeah. and, uh, and really giving us a good wake up call to this day. Yeah. Um, and uh, I hope we'll, we'll stay in touch. Uh, I will definitely extend the invitation to follow up with you through us. Uh, and then, uh, um, yes. and then Adriana or I will be in touch with you. Um, and to the rest, I wish a wonderful day. Yeah, lovely. All right, my dear friends. Well, look, that's lovely. And I'm always happy to help for what it's worth. So Thank take you very care. Much. My pleasure. Okay. Thanks. God bless. Have a nice day. Hopefully I'll see you again sometime. See you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. See you, Jeff. Good night. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye.